Before we get to Australian wicketkeeping legend Adam Gilchrist, I'd like to thank Toyota and their Good for Cricket initiative, which has raised more than $4 million across the journey and more than $513,000 this summer alone for grassroots cricket clubs. For every six that it's hit in the BBL, $500 is donated to a lucky community cricket club. Now, this number is constantly growing. As I said, it's $513,000 thousand dollars right now and it's going to be more tomorrow it'll be more the day after that so for the latest figures head to toyota good for cricket dot it's full it's down the ground it'll be at least one saini he's got an injury with the groin it goes as far as the fence india incredible Richard Pant is the star well, for the last time this summer, you're listening to the follow-on podcast with Tom Morris and today's special guest, the captain of the Fox Cricket commentary team, Adam Gilchrist. Skilly, there's so much to unpack, dissect and discuss. I'll start with this. What did you make of what we saw yesterday? <laughs> yeah, okay, Tommy. Uh, just quite extraordinary, really, wasn't it? So magical for Test cricket, I think, uh, taking any sort of allegiance to putting that to the side. Um, just remarkable scenes. And I thought Mark Howard summed it up beautifully in the way he called the closing moment there, the winning moment, where he said that this Indian team has captured the hearts and souls of cricket fans all around the world. India win the test. They win the series. And they win the hearts and minds of cricket fans all around the world. Test cricket's hard. He's beating hard. It's beating true. One of the most incredible sporting performances ever seen on Australian soil. They were down. They were out. And India have risen. And they have held on to the Border Gavaskar Trophy in a truly epic test series. Now, I know that you know there's a bunch of Aussie cricketers sitting out there on the field and some in the viewing room who probably don't subscribe to that um, description. But... Yeah, you know, when you sit back uh, and I reflect on you know, 2005 Ashes when we handed over the urn for the first time in about 18 years uh, to 2001 in India where we, we felt like we lost the unlosable series having won the first test and having India down on the ground in, in the second test. I reflect on those moments and, and I, I think I knew deep down that I'd played in a series, a historical series that will go down as being you know, some of the best in, in test history. And I think that happened again yesterday. I think everyone can sit back and understand that this series and that particular test match will be spoken about and reflected upon for a long, long time for the right reasons for test cricket, regardless of who you support. So, yeah, it was uh, amazing effort by India and you know, clearly so, so very disappointing for Australia. So we'll get into the nitty gritty. There's so much to talk about, but... I think it's best to start broad and, and celebrate the achievement of India and how good they were. Where yeah. do you rank this uh, for an opposition team coming to Australia in the history of cricket in this country? Yeah, I, I don't know the fine detail of every touring team that's come here, uh, even of the ones that have been successful, which, of course, we know there aren't huge numbers of touring teams that have come here and... and uh, not just won a series, but lost the first game of a series and then fought back, uh, particularly under the adversity that this Indian team uh, faced throughout the, the series. So without knowing all the fine detail, it, it's, it does have to uh, generically rank up there with the greatest uh, alongside. I'm not saying it is you know, the greatest ever effort, but it's certainly got to rank alongside all the ones that um, have been bracketed in that upper echelon of um, outstanding stories of touring teams visiting. Just for all the little backstories and micro stories within this tour, uh, that that pushes this series as one of the most memorable and certainly that that recently come to mind. And then you know, not just about touring teams coming here, our teams going to other countries or or big clashes. And as I say, I mentioned two thousand and five Ashes. That seems to be the messaging coming through to me that uh, from friends and cricket followers that they haven't been as engaged uh, with the Test Series uh, since 2005 and, and, wow. and they're yeah. ranking this as a, as a greater series um, 
or certainly whether it's a greater all round series, but certainly as by way of an achievement, I think it, it ranks alongside any that have uh, occurred in, in test cricket. We've got the best stats man in the business, Laurie Colliver at Fox Cricket. You know him well, Gilly. And he's just flipped me through yeah. some numbers. And just, I think it's important to read some of these numbers out and these facts out to get some context. So it was yeah. the highest successful fourth innings chase at the Gabba ever. Before yesterday, it was 236. Australia hadn't lost at the Gabba since 1988. Yeah. It's a stat that's been thrown around a lot. Uh, the last touring attack to win at the Gabba yeah. was Malcolm Marshall, Patrick Patterson, Kirtley Ambrose and Courtney Walsh. India's attack had three tests between them. Yeah. Uh, 20 wickets. Australia bowled 684 overs among six bowlers for the series. India bowled 652 overs across 10 bowlers. And, and India clearly used 20 players. Uh, Australia used 14. Yeah. And the, the, the one that really got me, um, and it's probably more a reflection on the way India planned, and I'd love your thoughts on this as well. It, it was the first time since 1985-86, which was the which was the debut of Steve Waugh, he debuted that summer, where Australia did not score 400 in a test innings for the entire summer. What do you make of, of, of these numbers that paint India in an incredible light, this resilient, um, brave, um, re really strong team with great depth, as against Australia, a, a team of talented cricketers who just wasn't able to put it together at, enough to win a series which we thought was unlosable after the Adelaide test? Yeah, it's oh, those numbers are extraordinary, and I think that that stat about the four hundred not being passed by the Australian batting probably is symbolic of of the situation that the Australian team has been in for for a number of years now. We've had just probably had a few um, almost lone wolf moments of from our batting. Steve Smith, we can't question his um, skill and and uh, you know status in in world rankings and, and the performances he puts up and, and Marnus and, and David Warner it through various periods. Uh, but it, there just hasn't been a real collective batting effort with any consistency for, for quite a while now. So that's something that the Australian hierarchy will be aware of and, and, and will be trying to address. There's no doubt about that, but probably flipping it around the other way, to, to give credit to that Indian lineup that was so inexperienced that that shows you the enormity of the task they had at hand and the challenges they faced and how they just continually fronted up at the big moments. But yeah, I mean, there's discussion around about the Indian structure or pathway program mm. that they have to get into the Indian team. Now, Harsha Bogle, part of Fox Sports, Fox Cricket's coverage mentioned that these they're not necessarily young Indians. There's a couple, you know, Shubman Gill, 21, and uh, Washington Sundar, I think, 22 or 21 or 23. But, you know, the bowlers were a little bit more mature age, 27, 29. So they're not sort of fresh out of under-19 cricket. Harsha mentioned that a lot of these sort of reserve players have played mountains of India A cricket. And they've really put a focus on that sort of next level just below test cricket, but above first class cricket if you like above yeah. state cricket so they've tried to create this uh, little environment there that all these uh, more inexperienced players are getting a mountain of cricket there and that coupled with the backstories of a few of these particularly the bowlers who come from and more and more Indian cricketers it seems coming from really humble beginnings sort of more remote um, off the beaten track areas of, of India and they've got some amazing you know, family stories, life stories and journeys that have, uh, where they've encountered a lot of adversity and hardship and they've still forged through that, probably developed a, a, a great deal of um, character from those experiences. And then they turn up on this sort of the global stage, if you like, and, and they did not look out of place for one minute. So, yeah, it seems to me there might be some... some um, some sense in that, in the way they've gone about it and justification to what Harsha says. So that's something that perhaps, you know, with, it's been a challenging summer to have Shield cricket parked at the start and yep. no cricket domestically to allow us to even think about bringing other guys in and the COVID bubble and so on. But uh, yeah, there might be some uh, food for thought there about the bigger picture about, you know, having players ready to, to step in and, and start to um, 
not feel out of place at the top level. I mean, Cam Green didn't look out of place at all. He, he slotted in beautifully and uh, that's a real positive to come out of it for, um, for Australia and, and nor did Will Pukowski. He looked pretty, pretty comfortable there too. But um, yeah, there's a lot to think about and to take on, but at the end of the day, India just, they just got a hold of the big moments and, and ran with it more confidently than Australia did. Yeah, if you believe some of the stuff you read this morning or, or more so social media, and this is sort of the climate we're in, you'd think that yeah. they, they want to burn effigies of Justin Langer and Mitchell Stark yeah. at Cricket Australia, which is totally unfair, I think. Uh, yeah. In the end, the Australian cricket team um, actually performed at a level which we don't expect, but they weren't disgraceful and they were beaten by no. a team, this Indian team that we've never seen before. I just want to ask you, you, you played in an Australian cricket team which was renowned for its stability. For a long time, it appeared as if the only position that, t- that changed in that Aussie team that you were part of was a number six batting spot. You could go Langer Hayden and it went down to Brett Lee, Gillespie, McGrath, and it felt like it was like that for years. I know that there was probably more changes than, than what it appeared in, in hindsight. But what yeah. does it say about stability in cricket teams that India was able to win playing 20 players for the series and Australia who was seemingly more stable and has been for a while now, lost 2-1. Do we think we overrate the notion that you need to have a stable team to be successful? I would think more often than not, you'd, you'd prefer stability and continuity because usually that means that the players that are in the team are doing the job and warranting selection. Um, of course, you, you're always looking to... You know, I, I guess the idea, ideal is that you don't make change unless it's going to improve the situation or pr- improve the team. And from a bowling point of view, I guess that there's, there's been a few little question marks here and there, various batting spots. There's no doubt about that in the opening combination. And we haven't really truly found a, a true combination that's been held onto for any length of time for a, a good few years. Uh, but probably it's turning that question it's and it's, a, it's an interesting question more, more to the bowling unit i don't think other than maybe possible fatigue might have set in in the bowlers at the back end of the brisbane test and and maybe even down to the point of yesterday you know at the back end of that day but i can't think offhand of any change that you might have made they've been so well performed and they have been that yeah they've been the the consistent part of that team. So I, I don't think you could have forecast it, you know, what might have unfolded at Brisbane and said, oh, we, we do need to get fresh legs in. Like Pat Cummins was steaming in mm. still at the back end of day five. Hazelwood was still prepared. Nathan Lyon, Mitchell Stark had it, it was sort of a, an on again, off again series for him, but I, I'm sure he was there and ready to go and over the longer period they've been so well performed that bowling unit that I don't think you can question the 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 selection or the consistency of trust placed in them to get the job done because they have been the the component of that team that has consistently got the job done so yeah you probably don't need to delve too much into why it went that way other than uh but but yeah sorry in answer direct answer your question I think you prefer stability but India have proven that it doesn't always, and, and maybe the fact that these were so, these were players that came, not so much Rishabh Pant, but Shubman Gill, Mohamed Siraj, um, Natarajan, Washington Sunda, Shadal Takor, they didn't come with any reputation. Not to, at all. To, we didn't know who they were. The global stage. You know, possibly even to India. Yeah. You know, a lot of the Indian pu- public would have known them through IPL, and that's probably about it. So maybe that's, that the perfect storm turned up where they could play fearless cricket. If if it didn't work, no one was going to bag them out because it was it was a second string, third string team. So they could play uh, uninhibited. And Rishabh Pant's probably the case in point there that he did come with some sort of reputation, a reputation of being able to produce flashes of brilliance with some sort of, you know, level out by some poor choices in his shot making or yep. giving it away and looking to not dig in. And, but I tell you, he enhanced his reputation in a remarkable manner, didn't he? He, he got more cavalier, the more tense the game got. You, you must've enjoyed yeah. that as a keeper. Uh, I mean, when they needed, I don't know, 30, yeah. it was like, you've got enough balls just to knock it around and do this <laughs> in a canter, but no, nah, he just wanted to keep going. That was just brilliant. 
brilliant I tell you to what, watch. Tell you what else I enjoyed it was Washington Sunda um, playing a reverse sweep and getting out, playing a reverse sweep and acting as if he just he couldn't he couldn't believe that he missed a reverse sweep off Nathan yeah. Lyon. It's a shot this that they play these shots that are so outrageous for the normal punter like myself and everyone else watching. But for them, yeah. it's just another day of the office. Yeah, and the, the, I mean that's you're spot on that little moment there and how long he just stalled on the crease. And I'd love to know, I would assume it would have been the disappointment, as you say, the shock that I've, I've missed that stroke. How have I missed that? Um, but then, you know, reality would have set in for a minute for him thinking, hang on, have I just blown this, what we were in control of? I've opened the door again. So he'll learn so much from that that single moment, let alone the whole test match. Uh, I wonder if he's reflected on that and if they've discussed that or whether they just don't care. But, that, yeah, it was, a, it was like this learning journey that they that we were – it was unfolding before all of us and you could see their development and uh, and the belief just grow and grow and grow. So, yeah, fascinating. Uh, I love a line in Gideon Haig's article in The Australian today. He said, India stalked the target rather than chased it. They didn't look yeah. like – was it, was it three maidens after tea they faced? And there was a few murmurings around the place that they were actually batting for the draw now. But in fact, they were just getting themselves in to give themselves a chance to win yeah. the game, weren't they? Oh, they, you're spot on. And yeah, I was I was on air after tea and, and Rishabh Pant, who we thought was going to be the one to blaze ultimately like he did. But, you know, he was just really um, composed and, and solid in defence and he lay the foundation. And of course, you know, we expect Pajara, you know, his, the way his innings just ever so slowly progressed yeah. But he did always still, you know, if a wicket fell at the other end or they did come back, back from a uh, lunch or tea break, he just set it up again. He just went back almost to the start of his innings, sets it up, gets a little bit of momentum. And so too did uh, Rishabh Pant. That's what was so impressive. So it was, yeah, the, the, the old tortoise and the hare sort of <laughs> scenario they played beautifully. But um, And yeah, I mean, Pajara, you, it's got to be one. One of the most courageous innings in Test history. The battering he took, and he just did not flinch. He took his time to get treatment and composed himself, and then just fronted up next ball, usually with a perfect back or front foot defence. 50 of 196 balls, the slowest 50 of his Test career. And it actually means something as well. I mean, to do it in that situation was incredible. I think the best line of the whole series, from a journalistic perspective, goes to Russell Jackson from the ABC, who said that Pajara was like a human pinata, just being battered and bruised from all angles. And it's exactly what he was. And there was a graphic you showed on Fox Cricket. I think Brett Lee might have been in the lab, yep. where you, you had the red ball, little red balls on everywhere he's been hit on the body. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. 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 Well, I think Will Swanton wrote too that uh, from the Australian wrote that he just needs to go and get a full body x ray to check <laughs> for wherever the breaks are or the damage is, uh, just everywhere on his body. I reckon, I reckon his toe was about the only thing that didn't get hit. But uh, uh, it was that that was just fascinating to watch. And he did that several times in a, in a series, um, even to the point on, you know, the first day of the series back in Adelaide, in, in a test that they ultimately lost, but they pretty much dominated. Uh, you know, even that first day, he got 40-odd off about 160 balls or 170 in partnership with Virat Kohli. Uh, that was, um, you know, everyone thought, oh, this is Pajara. He's going to ruin the series. He's going to be boring. He's going to bat them out of it sort of thing. Bat, bat India out of it by being so slow. But that had its merits. On day one of a, a pink ball test, that actually put India into a position where they could have dominated that game and closed it out, but for the, the third day failures. Did if, if I take your mind back to the 2019 Ashes when... Australia seemed to make changes on a horses for courses basis. So yep. I think Mitch Stark might have played one test. I'm, I'm happy to be yep. corrected there. James Pattinson played a couple. And they made it clear, at the, and you saw this in the test, the documentary on Amazon, they made it clear at the start of the series that players weren't being dropped. They were just picking the right players for the right conditions. Is it yes. possible to do that in Australia? Could us, Not in hindsight, because we know what you said before yep. about this bowling attack and they all deserve to be picked, and I agree that. But in the future... Could they use 2019 as a blueprint for home series as well? Uh, yeah, I guess it comes down to... Well, I, I'm just trying to think out loud here about what pitches 
would require that sort of specialist type mindset of these bowlers. Uh, pink, pink ball test could require pink ball specialists if there is such a thing. Yeah. I'm trying to think who those pink ball specialists may be. I mean, Mitchell Stark, his, his numbers in pink ball tests are quite extraordinary. Uh, yeah. I, I was trying to think uh, who, who, who it could be. In answer to the question, uh, yeah, it's something that you would definitely be able to consider and have a look at. Uh, and I don't say that meaning Australia should have retrospectively. It's, it's just yeah. thinking ahead. You always want to look at your... But as I said earlier, if, if you think you can improve it by making change, that's probably time to make a change. So that's, that's a consideration that probably hasn't ever been taken into account here. It, it, it's probably, I would think, as much as they said horses for courses... I think as it's also workload and balancing out, you know, the the amount of um, stress and strain on these guys. So that might be more to the point. But the conditions here, the, the pitches here, uh, are generally nowadays all pretty similar. The, a, a big, you know, a, a big point out of the two Test matches uh, that finished the series was the fact that the day five wickets didn't do half as much no. as what we all anticipated, uh, and and that's not a fault of, uh, you know, Tim Payne or Justin Langer or the bowlers get, getting the judgments wrong. It, all of us did. We all speculated that day five, Sydney, they cannot survive with eight wickets in hand. They lost three. <laughs> day five, yeah. Gabba, we said it started like a day two or day three pitch. So what's it going to be like on day five? Well, it was still clearly a very nice batting surface, albeit with a couple of cracks that played a few tricks. But other than that, they scored 324 runs on the day and, uh, so that that was a uh, an interesting scenario. So as far as horses, I think the pitches now are all reasonably similar around Australia. So I don't know how specific you could get it. It'd be more a workload thing. So Australia bowled 228 overs in consecutive fourth innings and claimed 12 wickets for 663 runs. And they're a week apart as well. So we sort of saw the same thing repeat itself in different conditions at, at Brisbane and the SCG. Uh, Gilly spoke really well about Tim Payne yesterday, and clearly you're well qualified to talk about him. Brad Haddon has been on this podcast talking about Tim Payne, talking up his yep. keeping, his batting, his leadership as well. But clearly whenever an Australian team loses a series at home, the captain's going to be under pressure. But yep. I want to focus more on his role as a keeper and how can the Australian team get the best out of him as a wicket keeper? What's the solution? Is there, some, is there someone else that can captain and have Tim Payne still in the team as the best gloveman in the country? Or is that not even an option for next summer? Uh, I don't see any reason to change anything at the moment. So that's, you know, I'll sort of put that across uh, right at the top of this discussion that I don't yeah. think there needs to be a, a change. I don't think that he can be held to account for the uh, series loss, uh, him individually. Uh, there's a whole host of contributing factors, but specifically the pain. Uh, and I, I've never been one to pigeonhole that wicket keepers can't be captains. I can only speak from my personal experience, which I said on air yesterday. I, I had the honour of captaining, I think, about six test matches. I was vice captain for a, a significant amount of my test career. And I found I got more comfort out of being vice captain where I hopefully could contribute to the team's uh, direction and, and, and where a, a captain and a coach wanted to take us, but didn't have those all the pressures and expectations and, and um, you know, the, the, the list of the job description as captain to have to focus on. I was much preferred being able to just focus on my job. And that was primarily in my mind, wicket keeping first, yeah. then batting, and then, you know, doing what I can from a team point of view. Um, MS Stoney, outstanding captain for India uh, by way of results. Yeah. Everyone's got their opinion about, about who, is tactically a good captain, who's an inspirational leader, but is maybe a bit short on tactics. It's so open to interpretation, but um, I think Tim Payne has been a wonderful leader in the in the role that he's had in the situation he assumed a few years ago. Uh, and there's no need to to go and make any drastic changes at the moment. I think he, you know, reading his quotes this morning that he, I guess was saying yesterday afternoon, 
yeah, he, he knows it's a big boy's job. He's going to come under scrutiny and criticism and, and he's a well, well and truly aware of that. I did like his, his line that, you know, after Adelaide, everyone said that the Australia were amazing when in fact they were pretty ordinary. And then coming into day five in Sydney and Brisbane, everyone had said they haven't been all that great, but they were in the exact position they wanted to be in. Yeah. So they felt like they played really well to you know, turn up day five of any test match. Or if someone offers you at the start of a test, at the start of day five, you're going to be in this position, you'd take it every time, the positions they were in. So something went amiss at the back end of the game. So that may have been a blend of energy fatigue it may have been a blend of tactics the yeah. the bowling the individual bowlers and there's scrutiny he, he's he's spoken about that um and i think he's done a, an outstanding job as the leader of this team he's keeping up to this series up to halfway through this series has been impeccable yep. you know right since he was recalled back in those ashes of, uh, you know, four years or so ago. Um, his batting is as on song as uh, it's ever been. And the, what he's producing by way of runs and, and results with the bat is, you can't question that. At number seven, just because he's not blazing hundreds doesn't mean he's not doing his job. And to be averaging, uh, you know, in the early 40s, I think it was, across a, a test series like this one that was so intense totally done his job there so um yeah it's a delicate bal balancing act and he, he only he knows whether he's got the desire to keep trying to balance all those things you know the comments i'm reading are that he, he wants to do it still so i think we've got to back him and, and trust that that judgment is is right and he'll have learnt he hasn't ever come under the scrutiny he said um like he has in the last 10 days in his cricketing life so he'll learn from that and work out what things he needs to do to make sure that next time around in South Africa or the ashes next year, that he's um, trying to be able to be fully switched on with every facet of the game as best he can. I personally found that too challenging as a keeper yep. uh, over a long term. I, it was a great experience, but as I say, I don't, I don't pigeonhole that keepers can't be captains and I don't think that there needs to be, you know, dramatic change to Tim's p position or, or the team as a whole, uh, just simply on the back of this series. Oh, I do want to ask you one question before we wrap up about the Big Bash, because you're doing um, plenty of that over the next couple of weeks. But yeah. before I do, just one on Nathan Lyon as well, who didn't perform as he would have liked this summer. Do you think it was more that the Indians played him really well than he struggled? Or where, where do you put that balance? Uh, I think, you know, to be... To be open and honest a, a lot of observers and, and I probably fall into the, the bracket of questioning some field placements and some tactics about you know where you're trying to bowl and what ways you see you, 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 he potentially could get the batsman out in this series but that gets qualified by Nathan Lyon is uh, one away from 400 test wickets I've I've never bowled an off spinner in a test match, but um, in the so IPL, he, in the IPL, you have I think in the IPL, yeah, one ball, one wicket. So yeah, maybe I'm a bit more qualified than I think. But uh, he he has a plan that he works to, and it's been very successful. Um, you know, over the course of a hundred test matches, but uh, he'll be he'll be disappointed as much as anyone. And yes, India played him really really well, and I guess that's that's the thing with. with he and, and the Australian team bowled so many overs across the back end of these last two tests that, you know, maybe um, there might have, it could have been a, uh, a bit more versatility to, to the, um, the uh, method or the, 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 yeah. um, uh, the theory that he had of, of how he's going to get them out. But um, yeah, again, probably don't need to go too, get the blowtorch out on him at all. He'll be um, so disappointed and, and uh, he's got a bit to think about before his next series. Just one on the BBL before I let you go. I know you've got to go. I appreciate your time. But the we've got a number of exclusive games coming up. There's the Hurricanes and Scorchers on Friday night. Last night at the time of recording, the Scorchers were too good for the heat. Just broadly, who, who are you backing? Who's, who's your Give us your power rankings. Who's your favourite for the Big Bash title well, at the moment? 
Now we're on Big Bash. First of all, I've got to congratulate you, mate, on your, your debut Big Bash <laughs> call. Mate. Outstanding. Outstanding. You did a tremendous job, mate. Very seamless transition into the into the seat. So um, Thank you, Gilly. Bit, actually, I'm a bit nervous. that you, It was my seat that you took while I was allowed <laughs> to have an evening off to celebrate the end of the Test Series, and I'm a bit nervous that I probably shouldn't have done that now. So, <laughs> no, you, you, you can have it back. There's no stress with that. <laughs> you're a bit too good. No, brilliant. It was awesome, mate, and I guess that show. Is the depth across Fox Creel. What we got, it's it's great fun. It's a great team, and um, everyone just loves being involved in the Big Bash, don't they? And, yeah, and particularly awesome. now as it gets towards the towards the finals. Um, yeah, I, look, I, I say it every year. Normally, because I come from Perth and I'm their number one ticket holder, but I always like the Scorchers. But uh, in all seriousness, they are they are red hot, aren't they? At the moment, with their more so their squad depth, and you know they lose Mitch Marsh and uh, they've just got a really well-balanced squad, uh, a blend of international cricketers, so many international cricketers really are by way of, you know, the three from overseas, but most of that squad has played international cricket. Yeah. Uh, so they, they look um, very, very good, but so too the Sydney Sixers talking about squad depth there. I mean, they are length of the straight away on top of the table. And Did now... Josh Phillip, work? Yeah, Josh Phillip, he's so exciting. I think he's... He's a must uh, inclusion for the white ball tour, the T20 tour to New Zealand. Yep. He's um, definitely, that, that is a prime opportunity to get him in and not just get him there for the experience, get him at the top of the order and say, away you go, mate. Uh, but for them to think that they could possibly, and I don't know who is going to be available out of that bubble, the Australian test bubble, but the likes of Moses Enriquez, Sean Abbott. Uh, I don't know what Mitchell Stark will do, um, but... Uh, you know, Nathan Lyon. So talk about depth. They've got some big inclusions that they can turn to. And the other the other outlier who is just this, I don't know, mercurial sort of team that we can't ever track properly is the Melbourne Stars. Yep. Mate, they just, they're, they're almost going to miss out on the finals. It looked like about two games ago. Now they've clicked into a groove. They've got all these home games and, you know, the Spice Man's whacking them around. Yep. Uh, I thought Nick Larkin played it unbelievably good innings uh, in his last outing. So, yeah, you can't discount those guys either, um, given that they're back at the MCG and, and they, they're on a roll now. Gilly, there's so much cricket to discuss. We haven't even spoken about Sri Lanka, England, which is an exciting test match in itself as yeah. well. But uh, we really appreciate your time. Great work on Fox Cricket this summer in the test matches. Look forward to seeing you across the T20 roadshow that really kicks up now um, with yeah. the big bash. And uh, we'll chat to you again soon. Good on you, Tommy. Good to chat, buddy. Thanks for listening to the follow-on podcast. Adam Gilchrist was great. We've got Ishigua next week. And then in February, we'll have a special podcast commemorating 20 years since Sir Donald Bradman's death. And of course, we're here for Toyota, good for cricket. And their raffle has raised $513,000 this summer for grassroots cricket clubs all around the country. Now, this number is constantly growing. So for more information, go to toyotagoodforcricket.raffletix.com. .au. Overall, Toyota's Good for Cricket initiatives have raised almost $4 million to date. The test summer might be done, but there's plenty more cricket coming to you on this podcast and also on your television screens at home.